We're looking at an Academia Edu uh, webpage of a article titled The Solar Boat at Nowth, County Meath. Nowth is a passage tomb, a Neolithic Irish passage tomb uh, in County Meath, Ireland. It's west of Drogheda, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, somewhat northwest of Dublin. Uh, this article is written by Iman P. Kelly, I hope I'm pronouncing Iman correctly, and he is retired from the National Museum of Ireland in 2014, so almost a decade ago, uh, after more than 40 years experience as a professional archaeologist. Um, and uh, he went on to serve as keeper of the antiquities, of Irish antiquities, from 1992 to 2014, so more than a decade. Um, and that, I believe, is at the uh, National Museum of Ireland, if I'm not mistaken, or it might be the uh, Royal Irish Academy. Um, not 100% sure, uh, I'm pretty sure it's the National Museum of Ireland. So basically, you know, a professional archaeologist, a long career, uh, but on top of that, essentially, you know, custodian, uh, curator perhaps, of, of Irish antiquities. Uh, uh, basically, keeper, you know, has a sense of protection too, so I don't know exactly what the job description of the keeper of antiquities is, uh, but it might be worth looking into. Anyway, we're going to be discussing this. Um, we're going to go through the article and uh, comment on it. Um, let's just read what it says here. This is sort of the intro. Um, the solar boat at Nauth. At Nauth in Ireland, there's a large Neolithic passage mound at a bend in the River Boyne, which is an archaeological landscape of exceptional importance. I find it interesting that uh, Iman uses the term passage mound instead of passage tomb, because passage tomb is the common term, um, and it sort of limits the... Uh, it sort of narrows the description. I think passage mound is actually a, a better term because there are mounds with passages in them. And yes, they did contain human remains, but was that their only purpose? Personally, I don't think so. Um, you know, just like a church has human remains in it, it's, it's not its only purpose by, by any means. Um, so... Of course, not every church has human remains in it, but, but you know, many, many churches have crypts and, and, and so on, people buried inside the church, but they're not limited to being a, a, a burial area. Um, so, where were we? Um, the mound contains two passages constructed of large stones that lead to internal chambers, and debate continues as to whether the monument was built primarily as a burial tomb, sacred temple, or astronomical observatory or perhaps a combination of all three of these functions and that would be my take on it is that it's a, a combination uh, of the certainly an astronomical observatory in terms of uh, alignments with the sunrise on the equinox I mean that the passages are aligned with the equinox sunrise uh, there's also possible lunar uh, alignments at Nauth and other passage tombs. So, so they certainly had an astronomical observatory aspect, but that was tied in with their religion. So, so basically, you know, temples dedicated to the sun is another way of looking at them, and, and maybe even dedicated to the sun and moon. Um, in fact, there's some clear evidence pointing in, in that direction. Um, so let's keep going here, sort of rehashing what I already said. Um, large curb stones surround the mound and like the stones of the passages and chambers within these are decorated with motifs such as spirals, concentric circles, triangles, zigzags, lozenges, waved lines and crescents. Interpretation of these images varies however most commentators okay let's try that again 
interpretation of these images varies. Maybe a comma wouldn't hurt there. However, most commentators incline towards a view that the motifs are related to heavenly bodies such as the sun, the moon, and star constellations. The implication being that the builders of the mounds may have worshipped the sun and other heavenly bodies. This is actually quite interesting that he's speaking about most commentators and inclining towards the view that the motifs are related to the sun and the moon, uh, to say nothing of stars and so on, uh, because the sort of establishment archaeologists that, that are in charge of, of Nauth and Newgrange at the moment are very insistent that these motifs are actually just geometric, non-representational art that this is a quote we cannot understand. Um, I'm not going to name them, but but uh, that's pretty much their position, and, and it's hard to budge them from it. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see that uh, Mr. Kelly here is, is basically saying, well, no, actually most commentators incline towards the view that the motifs are related to the sun and the moon and so on. And, and I've identified uh, either depictions of solar eclipses at all of the Boyne Valley Passage tombs, or I have found symbolism inspired by total solar eclipses. So, so the motif is not an accurate drawing of a, a total solar eclipse, uh, it, but it's a symbol inspired by a total solar eclipse uh, in some cases. Um, but there are very, very accurate uh, depictions of total solar eclipses uh, and partial solar eclipses, and we'll get to that. Uh, but Douth, Stone of the Seven Suns, has seven rayed sun symbols on it. Nobody really disputes that they're sun symbols, except perhaps these archaeologists who insist that it's geometric, non-representational art. Um, but uh, when I first saw a photo of one of the uh, rayed sun symbols uh, carved into Dow's Stone of the Seven Suns. It was in a Time Life book called the Megalith Build. Oh, no, the Monument Builders. The Monument Builders. That's it. Uh, and I came across this in the mid 1990s. And the caption to the photo said, "Either the sun or an eye may be signified." Blah blah blah. Um, and I immediately recognized that uh, it could signify the sun and an eye. Uh, first of all, the sun is equated with being an eye in, in many, many cultures. But but these rayed sun symbols, particularly the one that was in the photo and three others like it, are actually quite accurate depictions of a total solar eclipse. Um, the, the, the stone of the seven suns might be more accurately described as the stone of the seven moons totally eclipsing the sun and revealing the sun's corona because that's what these rayed sun symbols look like and yes a total solar eclipse does often look like an eye staring down from the sky you've got a black disc of the moon as some people even perceive it as a hole in the sky and that black disc is then surrounded by the rays and streamers of the sun's corona radiating out all around it especially in the polar regions above and below uh, the poles um, it, it looks like the iris of an eye so so even modern uh, professional astronomers have seen this and and described it you know at least metaphorically as the eye of god i mean it's obviously not an actual eye it's the sun and the moon and it and it just looks like an eye. Um, and you can be sure that if, you know, in the 20th century and 21st century, you know, university-educated professional astronomers can see this and uh, blurt out it's the eye of God, well, I think you can be pretty sure ancient people saw pretty much the same thing and then responded to it maybe taking it a bit more literally or at least as a, a sign, a, a symbol. Uh, so let's keep going here. Let's have a little sip of tea um, before it gets cold. Um, so, where were we? Uh, yes. Um, evidence for the existence of ancient solar worship in Ireland and across prehistoric Europe is abundant and vestiges survive in early Irish mythology. 
An image is to be found on a curbstone in the northwest sector of the Great Mound at Nauf, the significance of which appears to have been largely overlooked. Designated as curbstone 86, it is a trapezoidal shaped stone on which a design has been carefully pecked into the surface. The interpretation presented here is that the image on, I guess it, it looks like it's missing it, uh, that the image on it expresses the fundamental cosmological belief of those who carved it and that the design is meant to indicate the diurnal motion of the solar boat through the cosmos. So, Iman P. Kali is, is identifying this particular carving or carvings as uh, essentially depicting the solar boat. Uh, so let's talk about the solar boat. Uh, the solar boat of Ra, the Egyptian sun god, is, is basically quite well known. Uh, other ancient cultures had the concept of the solar boat. So where did the concept of the solar boat come from? Well, it's actually pretty simple and straightforward. Um, during an eclipse of the sun, uh, the partial phases at times look, it's essentially an upturned crescent. Uh, you basically have a gold, uh, if, assuming it's low on the horizon, which you need for the, the concept of the solar boat to happen. Uh, so you're looking at a, a gold and sometimes even red uh, crescent uh, low on the horizon, either rising out of a body of water or sinking into a body of water at sunset. So if, if the sun, if the eclipse occurs at sunrise uh, and, and the, the crescent of the sun uh, eclipsed by the moon uh, is, is, you know, coming up, uh, you know, from the water and, and rising up out of it into the sky, you know, you can easily compare that to to a boat especially the the reed boats of the egyptians and other cultures uh should mention that the south american cultures uh had reed boats with uh you know sort of almost not exactly a crescent shape but you know basically upturned uh, uh stern and and bow uh so more or less a crescent shape or something closely resembling a crescent um and, and they had the same concept, and, and so did the Mesopotamians. Uh, and there's even the concept of a solar canoe in uh, indigenous American uh, myths and so on. Uh, so yes, if you see this upturned crescent of the sun um, coming up out of the water and basically taking to the sky, uh, or you see it sinking into the water uh, around sunset, well, it's not difficult to equate that with uh, a boat of the sun god, um, in, or the sun god in boat form. Uh, so let's go here, because we haven't even got the article yet, and there's not a lot of time left on this recording, um, although I'll, I'll probably have to do two. So Irish Lies Remembered, Ireland's premier genealogy magazine. So it's not even a archaeology magazine per se, Autumn 29, so not that long ago, issue 46. Um, and uh, here we go. Here's, here's the article. Okay, so let's see if I can read this. So the solar boat at Nauf, County Meath, by Eamon P. Ned Kelly. Um, and I should perhaps briefly talk about how I became aware of this. Um, I think what I'm going to do is discuss that, maybe get started in, in reading the article and interjecting, uh, but we're probably going to do most of that in a second clip. Um, so here's what happened. Uh, about a month to a month and a half ago, I took a membership at the Concordia University Library as a member of the public. I am not a student at uh, Concordia University. I was a student in the, uh, well, 1980, basically, before I was asked to leave. <laughs> it's another story. I mean, I didn't do anything bad, but I, I just skipped classes and took photos, and I wasn't keen on the indoctrination, and, and so I took up photography. Um, so they said, please don't come back. Um, and I didn't. I took up a career as a photographer. So anyway, but, but, but the public can 
get a free membership. I, I basically inquired about that. I thought I might have to pay some dollars. Uh, I wanted access to academic uh, papers and so on on the computer system. That was my main reason uh, because uh, some of the ap academic papers are not available online. You need to go to the, the databases uh, that are available in universities. And I found out that I could get a free membership in a library. All I had to do was provide my address and everything. So I did that. And one of the first things I did was research on Nauf, uh because I have a theory about the basin, uh, the stone basin, uh, what I see as solar eclipse symbolism uh, carved into the basin that's inside Nauf. Um And so I you know, ran searches on Nauf. And one of the papers that came up, and it was quite an old one, this, this, I don't know if it was an academic paper or perhaps a article in a, you know, more or less scientific journal, uh, but it was quite old. It was at least a century old. It was at least from the 1920s, and it might have been older. Off the top of my head, I can't remember the exact date of it. But it mentioned a solar boat carving at Newgrange, which I'd never heard of before. Um, this is the first time I'd heard of a, a solar boat being carved into the rock art at any of the Irish uh, passage mounds, now that I can use that term. Uh, and I, I thought, well, this is very interesting because, you know, I know quite a bit about the solar boat in terms of other cultures. And I do know that, as far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, total solar eclipses and partial solar eclipses are depicted in the rock art of Nauth and Newgrange and, and Douth uh, and Locru. Uh, Locru, excuse my pronunciation. I've, Locru is, is, I believe, the correct pronunciation of what spell that looks like Locru. Uh, so in any case, um, this was news to me. This was like so a month and a half ago, a month ago. I thought, well, this is very interesting. I should look into this more. And, and, and I tried to find more information about it and, and basically didn't come across anything. I maybe just didn't try hard enough, but, but I didn't find any new information. And then just a few days ago, there was a Facebook post by Anthony Murphy of Mythical Ireland, his Mythical Ireland uh, Facebook uh, group. And he put up a post about how Mary Cahill, another former um, keeper of Irish antiquities, who I actually have a pretty good relationship with on, on Twitter in terms of, you know, discussing things, um, she had posted a tweet quite recently uh, identifying a carving at, I believe, Nauth um, of, of what she identified as a solar boat. And so I responded to this. I had a little bit of back and forth with Mary Cahill, Mary Cahill, excuse me, um, on Twitter, and uh, that's still ongoing. And I, I tweeted to her, uh, you know, images showing the, the crescent shape of the sun near water and so on. Um, and then I did some more research. Um, I, I, I ran a search on solar boat Nauth, uh, because that's where the carving was that she was identifying as a solar boat. Uh, and this came up. This this was top of the heap uh, in Google search results for the search I did on on solar boat Nauf. Um, I noticing we've got just about a little over a minute left in twenty minutes of recording time, so I think we're gonna wrap this up before getting into the actual article. And I'm just gonna read the article and and. I, as I read it, if some thought pops into my head regarding what was said, I'm going to say what I'm thinking. I'm going to be thinking out loud, as it were. Um, so I see we got 50 seconds left, uh, so I guess we won't be yammering on too much. I'm debating focusing closer on the screen so we just see the article, we don't see the whole screen. And yeah, we got 30 seconds left, so I'm going to end this clip now. I may reframe the camera so it's seeing only the article, and then we'll start up and we'll do a second clip. Hopefully we'll get everything wrapped up in 20 minutes, but if not, I might have to do a third clip. But this introduction has certainly gone on uh, quite a bit, and I uh, wasn't expecting that, but, but I can be just a tad long-winded. <laughs> 